Hello. Okay. It's, uh, well, well, let's. Let's so welcome everyone to our seminar and uh, today we are really happy to have Sasha Moyna who is this is me to hear in Minnesota uh that moved to Lausanne and for the closer to the KSL and now is back in the States in the University of South Carolina and today uh, is going to talk about the classic for new one charge CFT here thanks for presenting me it's a pleasure for me as always to to come here and uh, give my presentation so th this topic is pretty is pretty broad so as you see i have about 60 slides it's not i'm, I'm not going to cover everything so but what, what i wish we do so if you have questions please interrupt me and uh, at, at any moment i would rather discuss discuss it more in more detail other than covering a lot of space. So this work is based on a paper in collaboration with the student machine, but they're from EPFL and uh, Ricardo Rotazzi. So the, the, main, the main motivation for, for this work is to understand how to deal with um, processes with many quantum. So for instance, if we study scattering with um, many, particles in, in the final state, then those processes cannot be described through turbulence. Perturbation theory breaks down. Due to the multiplicity of, the, of those processes, there is no way we can analyze it. However, we want to understand what, what can be a, an alternative approach so that we can say something about quantitatively, not only qualitatively, about those processes. Usually, what we believe that Semi-classical methods should work once we have, uh, say, large occupation numbers or just large quantum numbers. We usually expect that semi-classics work, and for that we need to find some non-trivial solutions, non-trivial profiles, and usually it's still it's hard. Okay, even for um, so sufficiently simple theory. So in order to to have a, a more clear-cut playground, we I'm, I'm going to be using CFT. But at the same time, CFT is also interesting because it appears in many uh, parts of physics, right? So studying CFT on its own has also it, its merits. So at first, let, let me just remind you, I, I, I know that many of you know what, what CFTs are, but just maybe for students, just to make my presentation more complete, I'll, I'll go through this pretty fast. So conformal transformations are those transformations of coordinates that change metric of any space after conformal factor. Okay, and if, if I take this metric to be flat metric, then we know what, what this group is, the group of transformations. Obviously, any correct transformation preserves the metric, therefore it rescales the metric by a trivial conformal factor. <laughs> However, there are more generators of this conformal group uh, <coughs> other than just Poincaré, not just rotations, <laughs> boosts, and um, shifts. One of them is dilations. So it's when we rescale all the coordinates and the other can be generated by inversion. And it's called a special conformal transformation. So we, if you consider a composition of inversion, then translations and then inversion again, that's the special conformal transformation. And, and that exhausts all the, the whole group or algebra of conformal theory, of con conformal uh, transformation. So um, infinitesimally, you can- Sash, can we count now? Sash. Oh, Sasha. What is called conformal feeling equation in D dimensions, if D is larger than two, then you will find that conformal feeling can be just a constant, which is just shift corresponds to momentum omega mu nu times x nu. So linear in x, this is just rotation or boost. Then those are dilations, and this is special conformal transformation. And the crucial feature of conformal field theories is that the energy momentum tensor is traceless. 
what we usually have that if we take energy moment and tensor and we consider traits, then it's proportional to some data function, or at least the first coefficient of the data function of this theory, right? But in conformal field theories, the trace of the energy momentum tensor is zero. All right, what are the constraints that the, the conformal field theory, that conformal symmetry imposes on our theory? It can be understood in the following way. If, we, if I take just Poincaré, obviously, say, two-point function can depend only on the difference between the two points. If I if I consider all the shifts of the Poincaré, then obviously depends only on the difference between the two points. If I take into account rotations and moves, means that my two-point function should be just a function of x minus y, minus x1 minus x2 squared. Now, if I use dilations, this is nothing else but just dimensional analysis, right? It tells me that if the dimension of my operator OI is delta I, then the correlator should be given by this expression. And conformal field theory imposes even stricter condition. It tells me that all the correlators of operators with the same dimension can be non-zero, right? So in, in a sense, this coefficient can be is proportional to delta ij, to chronicle delta n. I can always rescale my, my operator to, to be normalized to one, OK? Now, Conformal field theory, conformal symmetry it happens to impose even more constraints on three point constraints on three point functions. So three point functions should have the following expression. But here, this coefficient lambda one to three cannot be rescaled anymore because I already fixed the normalization of my operators O1 and O2. And those powers here are just related to the mention of operators. So delta one minus. What about four point functions? For four point functions, those are not fixed. And the reason for that is, is extremely simple is because I can form, once I have four points, x1 and two, x3 and x4, I can form what is called conformal ratios. And conformal ratios, they are invariant. Once I, if I perform conformal transformation, those ratios become, they, they stay intact. Therefore, if I take any function that depends on those ratios, then there is no way to fix this function other than from dynamics. So this is what we say that kinematics, kinematically, four-point function is not fixed. However, uh, in formal field theories, they have one crucial property is that the OPE in conformal field theory is convergent. It's not just the asymptotic expansion. So if I take two operators called x1, x2, and they consider all possible correlators or and for functions, and those operators are the closest ones, then it can always expand as a series. It's equivalent to a series of other operators. And this exp expansion is converging. Those coefficients are nothing else but the coefficients of, uh, of three-point function. Because if I now consider three-point function of, with all delta, then only one term then survives here, and it's precisely the form of a three-point function. So then any four-point function obviously can be written if I expand OP in one, two, OP in three, four, and then I know any four-point function. But for that, I need to know all dimensions, and I need to know all those coefficients, which are called fusion coefficients or just couplings. So it tells me how strongly O1 and O2 are mixed in a sense. So that's like a lightning review of what uh, conformal field fit, yes. Why is the OP convergent? Is there some intuition for that? Uh, intuition for that is simply just operator state correspondence. That is, since you have operator state correspondence, if for any operator there is a state, states, they belong to Hilbert space. Any state can be expanded in terms of other states of this Hilbert space. And it's convergent, obviously, right? Got it. Thank you. All right. So that's it. This is what we call, uh, in order to solve uh, conformal field theory, it's, in, it's very easy. You just need to know all possible fusion coefficients and all dimensions. So when I say easy, of course, it, it, it's... Uh, I'm just kidding. 
All right. So what what is known? So you using this simple relation that if I perform O1 or OP O in the channel one, two, and three, four, or I perform in one, three, two, four, the result should be the same. This is what is called uh, this crossing condition, and this is the main equation for bootstrap. Are the, are these operators on the left uh, they commutable? Uh, is, is, is O1 no, is three? Here, this is understood in, in, in the sense of t, like a T product t or, 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 yeah. But, this is actually what I'm talking about. It's Euclidean, but in Euclidean, there is nothing else other than T product, other than radial quantization. Well, I'll, I'll get back to you. So what are the results? And that was actually part of, uh, of the motivation for us. What people observe that if you try to do this bootstrap approach and you consider, say, any career with dimensional delta, and then you look for what are the accurators that appear in the OP of delta with itself. You see that there are accurators with dimension to delta plus one. So this, in general, if, if you have an interactive theory and you have operators say O1 and O2, the operators something like O1 times O2 may not even exist in this theory. Moreover, the, its dimension does not have to be like a sum of the two dimensions, right? It's only in free theory that if you take, say, phi squared and you multiply it by phi cube and it becomes phi to the fifth, right? And its dimension is just a sum. Usually it's, it's not like this. Here you see that if the spin is large, then this term is neglected. And what we observe is like theory becomes free or like semi classic, okay? So therefore, it's, it's an interesting question how to see that from a more theoretic perspective. So if it's semi-classical, it means that we can find some solution and uh, evaluate the action. So the standard procedure for uh, semi-classical method. What does the spin here refer to, though? I mean, spin of, the spin of, uh, of an operator. So if... Uh, because it's a conformal field here, right? So you don't have... So what, what, is this? What, what, is this? what do you mean? Even, uh, so what operators can have spin, right? Yeah, operators can have spin. So you're, you're looking at very large spin operators. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm taking two operators, say scalar operators, and taking those are scalar operators. And I'm looking at for, what, what's the OP. In the OPE, you, you can have not only scalar operators that contribute to the OP. There are There is the whole tower, right? So for instance, there are operators of large spin. And of course, when I say both operators, it's operators and it's descending. In the, in the OP, there are there are all of them. But uh, yeah, if you look at large spin operators, you are sure that there are there should be operators with this specific dimension. Is it spin or just angular momentum? Ah, yes. Uh, yes. But this is look if. Let's put it like this. Imagine an operator something like phi one d mu d nu phi two. Right. This is this is what I call spin two operator. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, it's rank uh, rank k uh, traceless symmetric uh, tensor. Okay. Twist. No twist. That that would be dimension minus minus spin minus what I call spin. If you wish, angular momentum. Yeah. But can you say again in which sense the theory becomes free? It's in, in the sense that there are operators of this dimension. Uh, but there are also operators of lower dimension. No, that there are definitely there are operators of, of lower dimension. The, the lower lower dimension, say for smaller spin, there are other operators. Okay. But this is a maximum oh. dimension operator. That I think is too well, what, what, what is that? No, you, you, the <laughs> is simply that from the crossing, you are sure that there are operators of this form. Usually, you do not expect that those operators are always the same. Right. Okay, it, it, especially here, it's regardless of the coupling in your theory. You may say uh, that if my coupling is small, then dimension of delta one or delta two should be. Should be Sasha. Sasha. Uh, However, uh, here, regardless Sasha. of the interaction. Okay. Uh, uh, what is interesting to do is actually to study not spin, 
with other quantum numbers. So let's let's introduce some internal quantum number like U1 charge in this theory, and let's study large behavior of operators for for large charge. So, Sasha, what was shown in our paper in, uh, with, with um, our colleagues that indeed you can write the sort of effective <laughs> and I will get back to this uh, a bit later. Because uh, we may say, what does it mean to have effective field theory if I have a conformal field theory? There is no scale. Sure. You, you'll see that there is a scale sure, yeah. for semi classical uh, approximation. And uh, however, before jumping there, I would like I, I would just illustrate how, how it works for for a very specific example where I do not have to resort to effective field theory. I can write the full. Okay, so what is my theory? My theory will be just uh, O2 symmetric or U1 symmetric scalar field theory in D minus epsilon dimension. So usually when we talk about Wolf and Fisher fixed point, we talk about four minus epsilon. Right? I'm gonna be doing three minus epsilon and uh, I'll show that you can find large charge dimensions of large charge operators. So anomalous dimensions, fusion coefficients in a systematic way. And we, we even write explicit form for operators for large charge. Okay. So what is this theory just a little bit more concretely? I'm always in Euclidean and I'm studying, the, studying this theory. So it's kinetic term plus five to the six. So obviously at in D equal three, dimension of phi is one half. I have to take six of them to have this dimension plus. So in, uh, in, in, in exactly D equal three, this is conformal. However, I'm studying at D minus epsilon. Therefore, lambda is not uh, classically, it's not uh, dimension less, right? So it's, it's dimension three minus epsilon, right? And then just normalizing this theory, I, I can find that the beta function for lambda is given by this expression. So it's d minus three times lambda plus some, which, yes. So the generate phi to the four? Generate phi to the four, no. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm not interested in phi to the four. Well, you're not interested, but don't you generate it anyway? In, in, in what sense? sense? Uh, how, how, well, I mean, if, if you enforce sitting in a critical point, but I, yeah, I am in, in, in critical point. I'm, I'm generating this just normalized plan. How, how do I generate phi bar phi to the what q one four? Right? I do not. No, but look. No, look, think, think, what do you, think of uh, standard Wilson Fisher, phi to the, why don't you ask, don't you generate phi square? I do generate phi square, but I, I tune it to zero. I'm choosing a point and in my scheme, I do not care about this, but if you can choose whatever scheme so that you are flowing in the IR, you're flowing to a fixed point. Well, critical dimensions which you measure at the base transition, depend on uh, dimensionality of the most relevant operator. Sure. Oh. No, no, no. Fine. Okay. So when I want this beta function to vanish, I want to, to, to be at a critical point. For this to vanish, it means that I have to find a relation between the coupling and the dimension, so, which is dictated by so it's small, it means that lambda is small. So lambda square is proportional. Okay, and corrections are lambda square, so it is perturbed. It's a small coupling. Okay, so now what about two point? Now I'm interested in operators with large charge. And I want to study this two point function of phi to the n, phi bar to the n. I'm starting from the simplest operator with large charge. There are zillions of them, right? So physically, it's like n particle going to n particle, or, or something. Yes, you, you can think of exactly. So if if you study 
or two two to two m minus two. Yes. So, but here it's better to to think about this as m to m. So it's not few to many, but more like many to many. Okay. And uh, what I was telling you, this is just x of the x to the power of the delta phi. And if I'm in free theory. Uh the dimension of this appearance uh, 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 Sasha, yes. uh, uh, may I ask a question or can, can, can you hear me? I can hear you and you may ask. I, I, yeah, yeah. It, before it was not possible, so so it's a try. But I mean, what 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 I was trying to ask before was, you know, in the previous slides, um, when you have this uh, total derivatives, um, my recollection is that when you are doing conformal transformation, that operator with total derivative are mixed up with operator which are not fully total derivative, right? So there is some limitation, you know, due to conformality. Uh, for, you know, kind of uh, a chain of operators which appears due to, uh, which uh, there are some um, constraints due to con conformal, uh, conformal uh, feature of the theory. Is it true? Look, Arkady, it is true. What I'm writing here, you're asking about this one, right? Yeah, 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 right. For me, this is, I'm not hooked up on the exact expression for those operators. We will deal with operators I will present you what are the operators in my case. Okay, mm -hmm. this is just to illustrate that it seems as if this operator has. It's like this operator in free theory or in generalized free free theory. I think delta plus delta is two. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I understood this, but I was trying to say to 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 recollect that there are some constraints relating this one to the operator which is not uh, of this type. You know, remember there is this kind of this chain of operator which are. Uh, I mean, uh, there are some kind of this uh, cho are chosen due to be to to have a particular conformal features. I mean, which includes total derivative as well as non total derivative, right? right? I mean, some uh, combination. It was used for, you know, when people considered this kind of. Um, can, or, or can you, yeah. with total derivative cannot be even prime. They are not primaries, right? Yeah. But let's yeah. let's yeah. get to, to, to yeah. my uh, construction and we'll see what those operators are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so okay. No, it just was. Uh, uh, I, uh, but also it was a check that the system does work. So, okay, because it did not work. Sorry about interruption. Uh, yes, yeah, so dimension of, of, of phi is precisely n times the classical dimension. n times one half if we are in three dimensions. How do I find the anomalous dimension? I just normalize my phi. I find the efficient, I differentiate, the, right? That can be. This is the way to find the anomalous, the standard way to find the anomalous dimension. If you do that, you just need to compute the diagram. So here I'm not just writing many, many legs that stick out from here. I'm just trying, I'm just taking three legs and I'm putting them into three legs. And here I still have n minus three. Okay. But obviously, renormalization comes only at two loops. I compute it and I find that anomalous dimension is given by this expression. Now, if I ask myself, what is the total dimension? What I have to do, I just take this delta phi and take into account that D is not equal to three, it's minus epsilon, blah, blah, blah. I put it all together and this is my expression. So if lambda is zero, imagine that lambda is zero, so I'm exactly at D equal three. It means that my theory is free and this is precisely n over two. But all the corrections, you see, it's like lambda squared times the polynomial in M all the corrections can be written in, in the following way. It's like m times the function of lambda m times n to the zero times the function of lambda m. One over n times the function of lambda m. Okay? So taking this expression at face value, obviously I cannot go further than lambda m squared over 12 pi squared more than one, okay? Or quarter one. So this one will break down. However, it suggests that the general expression is just this, the structure. That the overall structure is just n times some coefficient of lambda n, delta times n to the power zero times function of lambda n, and so on. 
So it's an ex expansion in one over n with coefficients that are functions of lambda n. So this is like a Tohovsky coupling. Almost. Exactly. This is precisely like the Tohovsky coupling, except that it Tohovsky coupling. This is like a characterization of a theory. Here is a characterization of a state, right? But there is no large parameter in my theory. I'm just taking phi to the n. Okay? But this is precisely top coupling. Or you can think about this as like RG summation. But but uh, Sasha, the way it's written, uh, it looks like it is lambda n squared divided by 12 pi square, not lambda n. No, look, yes. I'm, uh, if, if you want me to write here lambda n square, I can, but I, I just... No, I'm looking at your de delta de delta expansion. Look there. There is lambda n squared divided by 12 pi squared, right? And it, it, is a, it is a function of lambda n squared divided by 12 pi squared. It yeah, is. right. Uh, so then breaking could be um, for la la lambda n larger than square root of 12 pi square. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Yes. I'm, I'm just saying that. It's yeah. Lambda it's n bottom line. The bottom line is yeah. square root of. Ah, here, yes. yes. <laughs> well, thanks. Good. Um, so, but how do we find those coefficients? How can we can can we do better other than just perturbation theory? And I'm just gonna tell you that this is everything that I do, nothing more. It's as simple as that. I'm, I want to compute this integral. This integral can be computed perturbatively if I consider lambda much smaller than one. They expand in this exponent, of course. It's, you know, I cannot do that, but I do that formally. And I compute all the moments, right? Some f to the 2n plus 4 plus 8 plus uh, 12, and so on and so forth. And this is my expression, right? If n is sufficiently small, then this is a legitimate thing to do because this term will be larger than that term. However, once n becomes large, this term is re the relative importance of this term is n squared compared to that one because it's flat. Is like n and plus three halves and then plus five halves. Right, so gamma function grows. So gamma of n plus five is n squared times gamma of n plus one half. Therefore, once lambda n squared become sufficient just of order one, this uh, expansion breaks down and I cannot say anything. However, the way to do this integral, we all know how to do this integral. Just exponentiate the thing and, uh, and find a new set of okay. This is what I, what, what exactly I'm, I'm doing right here. So we, if you exponentiate like this, then you find a new set of, and you see that expansion in these ones, the loop, in a sense, loop counting parameter is still lambda. However, my saddle is just a function of lambda n. Okay. And indeed, the, if, if you can consider the, the log of this thing, one over lambda times function of lambda n, plus lambda n, so on, or you could write it in n. This is like totally analogous to what we were saying before. It's n times f. So see here, I'm missing one over n. All right, so let's let's do this for uh, for our field theory. In this case, I have two functions. I have this f integral, and I exponentiate those fields phi to the n. I write them as n times log phi. So now instead of finding just the set of for s of phi, which was a trivial set of phi equals zero, I have to take into account those sources. And if I take into account those sources, First of all, let, let's perform the following scale. I rescale phi to the phi square root of n. Therefore, the overall n factorizes from the action, and the action becomes actually just a function just d phi squared plus lambda squared n squared. Okay? And we see from here, finding a saddle, the saddle will be a function just of lambda n squared, lambda squared n squared. And the loop counting parameter or the expansion parameter. For my uh, semi classical approximation, semi classical expansion will be just one over n. This is my large coefficient. This is like one over h bar. 
Is it clear? Okay. Good. So, what do I do? I just find equations of motion for this action, including sources. And it happens so that I can find this um, solution. However, this solution is only valid for very, very small lambda n. So I'm still in the same regime where I was before when I expanded those functions in lambda n. So I better reproduce the, the same or similar result. And indeed, if you now evaluate the action on this solution, you do everything and there are some coefficients that pop up. Related to the normalization, this finite renormalization of this time, we just rescale times x1, 2 squared with this number. And this number is just wise, it's just a dimension. You can compare with what we had before, but only the leading term. Okay, it's lambda n cubed the way it should be because the rest is just 1 over n suppressed. So what we find here, we find only the first term in there of this function. The rest will, I, I need to go to one loop in order to find one over n corrections. However, if I manage to find a saddle for arbitrary lambda n, then I get this function total. Okay. Okay, so at small lambda n, yeah, you can say that there are two saddles. One is trivial and you expand the outside. Yes. You know, and another is non trivial uh, and you reproduce uh, the same result. Yes. Right. Exactly. So, but now I want to find the, the saddle that that is for arbitrary lambda. Okay, for that I do not know how to do that from conform from um, fields. I need to use a crucial property of conformal field theory, which is just the operator state correspondence. Operator state, cor yes. By the way, before you move on, let's see. Yep. Why did you why did you work in V equals three? This could work for any dimension, right? As long as you have a, as long as it's conformal invariant. Oh sure, yeah. Oh. It, this is just, we at first we did it for uh, Wilson Fisher in four minus Oh, Okay. This is just for consistency of my presentation because later I'm going to be writing uh, explicit form for operators in V equal three. And why in V equal three? Because it's easier there. I need to pay to worry only about spherical harmonics on two sphere other than spherical harmonics and four spheres. I don't want to write too many indices. But in principle, yeah. Any in principle, any uh, any conformal field theory will work. Okay, just to clarify, so you didn't find- Not two-dimensional. You, you didn't? No, uh, look, uh, we, we, we can talk about two-dimensional, but I'm, I'm working not in, in, in two dimensional. Yeah. Yeah, so you didn't find the saddle with lambda n uh, oh. in, uh, analytically or like- at, at the moment, I haven't found, I haven't presented a saddle for lambda m bigger than one. Yeah, but this is a problem that you cannot find it analytically or in principle. I, I'm, I'm showing you how to find the saddle. Okay. So but in principle, you could find it numerically, for example. Sorry. No, but I'm, I'm going to be doing everything analytically. Yes. I, I can do my, I can do it in analytic. So the way to do it is to 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 use operator state correspondence. Conformal field theory, as you know, conformal transformations, they take, say, lines or um, planes into spheres or circles, right? So for instance, if, if when I talk about Poincaré, it doesn't mean how I slice my space when I quantize my theory, whether I slice it like this or I boost my theory and I slice on a different. So what I call time, if, if those transformations, uh, if, the two systems are related by a um, say Boris transformation. It doesn't matter where it quantize my space. The same logic applies here as well. However, here I have much richer transformation properties. So instead of quantizing on a plane, I can quantize on spheres. Okay, and it's it's written like this. So I can the plane can be sliced in circles, and those circles I treat so the radial component becomes just time. Okay. So a theory that lives on, say, Rd, it becomes a theory living on a cylinder. And the cylinder is just time times d minus one dimensional sphere, because the, those slices were just d minus one dimensional spheres. OK, and the statement is that any operator in here, it just creates a specific state on, 
on a cylinder. Just to illustrate, and we will use it later. So the transformation is obvious to you. How now is the time? Can we turn it? Yeah. So if I take free period and I map it on a cylinder, I generate phi square term. It looks like mass term, but in fact, that originates from just phi square r interaction on the sphere, right? There is a non trivial operator due to the curvature, okay? So it is conformal, but the mass is allowed, okay? So then if I just expand it in, in terms of spherical harmonics, I just quantize not in terms of the plane waves, but just spherical harmonics. Those are creation operators, just writing it slightly more explicit. So it's a zero zero, this is a one zero, one one, one minus one, right? And now F on the vacuum with five, and you see that this is precisely a zero zero acting on the five. So I have a state that is exactly just my operator on the sphere. My aspirator on the plane. So now a zero zero, this is one state. Another state one zero, it's a derivative with respect to zero. One one is a derivative with respect to e plus. And so on. So say phi square, it's twice this guy. Now I haven't told you what I call primary or descendants. Primary operators are those that cannot be written as derivatives. Okay. So those are primary, and those are descendants. So now we uh, we have everything in our in our hands to to continue. So I take I assume that the lowest dimension of operators with spin with charge n is just phi to the n. This is the only assumption that I have to make. Okay, and then what I need to compute, I take my theory on on a cylinder, and I say compute the following uh, matrix element. We all know that if I'm in Euclidean space and I consider evolution for large Euclidean times, right? I basically project onto the ground state of this theory. Or, right? Not this theory, but the, the, the smallest, the lowest lying state that has non trivial overlap with psi n. And since I'm assuming that this is the state that corresponds to phi to the n. I will find precisely the dimension of operator delta phi n because dimensions are just energies of those states. So now I have this theory, I add this lambda and I compute this matrix element, this transition amplitude. Okay. Now, the only subtlety here is what psi n to choose. Sasha, may, may, may I ask you? Uh, uh, yeah, capital T is just Euclidean time. I'm, I'm considering the evolution operator from, say, I don't know, T minus T over two to T over two. Uh, uh, Sasha, it's a, uh, may I ask you? So now, if I use the yeah. coordinates for my fields phi, so instead of phi one plus i phi two, I write as an absolute value times the phase. Uh, then I can write a sort of almost like a Fourier transform. I can write a state, I can choose any state with charge n, as long as it has a non-trivial overlap with the lowest line state of charge n, it will project on this state. I'm just trying to make my life easier. And I'm choosing this form for this state. So obviously it's like e to the ipx. I'm doing just for e transform because I'm just saying that. Uh, Sasha. Uh, it shifts on time. Yes, listen. Sasha. Right? So, because the momentum that corresponds to chi is just dd chi. Differentiate this one with respect to d d d alpha. It precisely gives you m. Okay. So if you insert this into the path integral, it changes the full Lagrangian by just this boundary term. So it's like insertion at one boundary, the other boundary, and it can be written as total derivative in time. So obviously it doesn't change my bulk equations of motion, but it changes just the boundary condition. And this boundary condition is precisely just to fix them. Disregard those i, those i is just because I'm, I'm in Euclid. It's just to fix the charge. So 
you can convince yourself, yourself the solution for this chi is just a linear in Euclidean time. And the solution for rho is just a constant. So what I have is, is for my initial field, phi is just the absolute value that is constant e to the i mu t. This is what we have, say, in like for a superfluid. That's why I'm calling that my saddle point is just a superfluid state. Okay, and, create, and parameters of this superfluid are related to the charge and coupling in the following. In this new, if you solve these equations, it's given by this. And going back to Arcadi's question, I do see that everything depends on lambda squared and squared divided by 12 pi squared. However, now I'm not restrict, restricted to lambda m square over 12 pi squared to be smaller than one. It's an arbitrary statement. I can do that for arbitrary lambda square and square. Okay? So just to make sure I haven't said this. This function is analytic for lambda and small. It's not, of course, it has a cut, but the cut is not at lambda, doesn't start at lambda m equal zero. Um, then I already mentioned that it looks like we're summing large logs for RG. I'm fixing lambda, but I'm taking into account all um, effects of lambda, lambda log or alpha log. Okay. Sure. Now for small uh, lambda m, obviously just one half and it's equal to m and it's the dimension of the classical dimension of my field. But for large, it becomes lambda square root of lambda m. So evaluating. Yes. Just just a check. So what is the charge? So there's a constant charge density. So what is the charge density? What controls it? Is it something you can control? The charge density is my charge. Charge it's, density is the charge divided by the volume. So yeah, it's the volume, volume, volume of the sphere. So then what what do you mean? What if I have the volume of the sphere is fixed? My charge is fixed. Therefore, the charge density is fixed. So well, let's say that I, I Take volume to be one. And then choosing. Okay, I, I understand. So your, your answer is in the units of the volume. Okay. Yes. So now evaluating the action on uh, on this solution, I get this expression. I said that mu is a function of lambda squared and squared, but it's for arbitrary one. Now we can check that it's standing for small lambda m. Indeed, I will produce precisely the result that I showed you before. However, I can do now much better. I can expand it for arbitrary lambda m. And that's my contribution, that's gonna be the contribution. Okay, so we know what the dimension even for lambda n larger than one. Okay. So what about fluctuations? Fluctuations can be just a, well, let's consider fluctuations of my solution. I expand up the quadratic order, uh, I diagonalize, and I see that there are two branches of fluctuation, right? I have two fields, there are two, two harmonic oscillators, right? So in a sense, my polynomial will be a well, obviously a quadratic order around this non-trivial profile would look like this, right? With coefficients which are energy of those fluctuations. Yeah. Uh, Sasha, uh, uh, can I ask uh, uh, Sasha? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I wonder when you are doing projection, you know, from, uh, you know, this, um, you know, um, Euclidean space to uh, cylinder, right? Uh, I wonder um, uh, that in some way, um, you know, uh, your operator polar expansion was in uh, in Euclidean, right? And cylinder, strictly speaking, is not Euclidean. The wonder is, is Euclidean cylinder. The wonder is Euclidean. Ecl is Euclidean, I see. I see. So, so there is no p problem with this kind of, uh, you know, uh, short distances. No, there is no problem with that. It's uh, mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything. It's just a change of variable. No, I nothing. see. Okay. Okay. So 
what are the states that uh, the fluctuations around the brown state are those that are written as just creation operators acting on this vacuum, right? By the vacuum, I mean the ground state with charge M, the one that corresponds to phi to the M. Right, so if I take A phi M, it creates a state with spin L and projection and J3 equal to M, right? It means that there is an operator with spin L and its dimension is omega minus. The same goes for omega plus, right? So we generally have the whole tower of operators, delta with the following dimension. Right? If I take, say, I add twice with omega L1, three times with omega L7, and I have all those operators, okay? Dimensions, I do not know what they are, but I, have, I know that their dimensions are like this, okay? So now let's just, let me just comment about this stuff. So if I take L equal one, so for spin one, then I see the J, which is not, nothing else, but um, the eigenvalue of Laplacian on, on, this, on, on this here is just one in D equal three, two in D equal three, and then you can convince yourself that omega minus is equal to one. So it means that whenever you act with A1 on the vacuum, it increases dimension by one is, is acting with a derivative. It means that this is a descender. This is not the primary. All, all the rest are primary operators. Now, for omega minus of zero, this one is gap. So it's gapless. It's, it corresponds to just a goldstone corresponding to the broken U1. And for a large lambda n, omega plus gets the cup. So if you take lambda n much larger than one, mu is the largest parameter. I can forget about this with minus. I left over with this, but with plus becomes something like mu, so it's gap, and I can integrate it out. So what spontaneously broke the symmetry? The choice of, of my solution, yeah. right? My solution so is F turn, times- Yeah, you turn on some background and it broke the- mu. Yeah, exactly. So of course it's not broken once I integrate over all possible, uh, but that, that, cor that corresponds to just charge conservation, if you consider, say, correlators. If I take into account all possible setups, because there is a zero, zero, zero mode, like a parameter, like a collective coordinate. But for this one, considering just a fluctuation, it corresponds just to, uh, yeah. So I think I'll skip the this part and um, move to expression for operators. Uh, Sash, uh, uh, may I ask you, uh, besides phonon, uh, if it, you have U1, you can introduce photon as well, right? Uh, can you introduce a, a kind of... I'm not, I'm not gauging anything. Yeah, yeah, I want, understand that you are not gauging it, but but it, I think it's interesting to see what what would be, you know, if you would add a, a gauge a gauge, a gauge boson to, to, to the construction. If I add a gauge boson to the construction? Yeah. I think people were trying to do, I, I do not understand what's the interest in this. What is an operator of phi to the n? This is not gauge invariant. No, 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 no. It's, the, the interest is that it's like emission of photons, right? Uh, uh, and uh, and there would be similar story about, you know, how uh, that you have multiple photons emission. Uh, so, so it would, no, I mean, it's... That, that, maybe, that, a different, a different it, it's a different story, I agree, but I'm just, yeah, because you see, it's kind of emission of masses particle from the masses particle, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, you're saying that phi to the n can generate a certain number of photons. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so just going back, I said that Hamiltonian is written like this, the k state is a specific um, energy is specific therefore specific dimension and I have the full power of these operators. But what those operators are, I do not know what they are. What I what I do know that dimensions of those operators are just smooth functions of my coupling constant. And for large lambda, I do not know how even how to associate an operator to, to its dimension. I can do this association for small lambda n when I can do my co computation perturbative. Once I associated it, then it can extend to arbitrary lambda n just to declare that this is what I'm going to be calling these operators, okay? 
it's associated to just its uh, dimension. Okay, so but instead of doing that for one for one zero lambda, let me do it first for lambda is equal zero. So precisely at uh, in free theory. Surprisingly, we do not know. We didn't know expressions for all primary operators, even in free theory. So but, uh, the problem here is that operators are degenerate in this case. So let's uh, just take free theory. And all operators of charge M in general can be written schematically like this. I have L derivatives, which are uncontracted. That guarantees that I have spin L. I have, say, 2K derivatives that are contracted. I have a certain number of N fields, and I have a certain number of phi, of phi fields and phi bar fields such that N1 minus N2 is equal to M. Let me forget about phi bar. It's totally generalizable, and then be focusing only on just phi, operators containing phi. And moreover, at first, let me forget about the operators where there are derivatives that are contracted. So in a sense, I'm looking only at operators that have L derivatives and M fields. Okay, and let me do the following. Now, if I introduce these coordinates, the only thing that I have to fix is I have to find how many there are operators or what they, those operators are for like the highest weight. So when I act only with B minus, right? Because all the rest I can then construct with acting with J plus and converting them from B minus to B plus, B zero, and so on. Okay, so first, how many operators are there? I just have to tell you how many ways I can distribute this L derivatives between M fields, right? So this is just a partition of L into M fields, right? This is just the total number of operators with L derivatives and M fields, linear limit M, right? Now, how many are their primaries? Primaries are those that the subset of those operators that cannot be written as total derivatives of this operator. And total derivatives is obviously just L minus one partition into M, correct? So this is what I have. Now, to any partition, any partition can be associated with a Young tableau. So, say I act with three derivatives on the first spin, three derivatives on the second, two on the third, and then five to the n minus three, right? And this is Young tableau three, three, two. Now, let's try understanding what this number is. How can I interpret this number? This number can be interpreted in the following way the number of partitions of L minus one can always be turned into number of partitions of L into M. If I just add to this young tableau, just one, one box here, that becomes immediately, this is a partition of L into M, not L minus one into L. So therefore the number of primaries is all possible partitions where there is no entry, where, mm, the number of young tableaus that does not have just one box, right? Because those can be removed by L minus one partitions. So in a sense, I have the number of primaries is given by this implicit formula that I have to find all the partitions with this property that L i is equal to L. However, it's bounded by one and it's bigger than by bounded by N and it's bigger than one. Okay, but that precisely reminds us here I just generalize it. That reminds us of the following. If I take like a creation operator L1 and spin spin L1 and projection L1 and L2 and projection L2, and I act on this one, this is just the way to generate all possible um, partitions, right? One of the ways. However, this L1 cannot be equal to one, as I, as I just said. Right? This one should be removed. Therefore, I'm not allowed to, to have strings of, of, of those operators with L equal to one. But this is precisely what we saw before when I was telling you that A1 is a primary. But we see that from a completely different perspective. I do not even know anything about uh, 
semi classics here. I'm just trying to build the number of primaries and I'm associating uh, those. So now to explicit expression, you take phi the way we I, I was doing before. I expand the spherical harmonics, except that now since my field is charged, I have not only A and A later, I have A later and B. Now I invert this relation by introducing, say, corresponding momentum. Sum, subtract this in a standard way, express ALM, and it's written like this, as the other document wrote. Now imagine that I act uh, with this ALM later on the back end. You can convince yourself that now you can expand X at X equals zero, but all the terms vanish unless it corresponds to D1 and so on. So this is the relation. Any creation operator it corresponds just to phi with that many derivatives. And the coefficient will be just some coefficient normalization of YLM contracted with unit vectors. So um, that basically tells us once we know a state, we can associate an operator. Now I want to know primary state to associate the primary operator. What is the primary state? If I consider yes, the formal algebra, the commutation relation is, is like that. The D with P is P and D with K is minus K. It means that P increases dimension of a state and K or energy, it decreases the dimension of the state. The way it should be <coughs> like the derivative and K is like the inverse of, of the derivative. Right? And what we call primary state is K acting on delta zero. And the multiplet of conformal states can be written as the delta generated by the primary operator and then acting with P. So it's precisely the way we build, say, representation of SO3 or SU2, except that so we take the lowest state with J minus acting on psi is zero. That's like a quote unquote primary state. And all the rest is built with acting with G plus, except that now it does not terminate. For SU2, it terminates. Here, it does not terminate. It goes forever. So now what I have to do in order to, to find a state K delta equal to zero, I need to have ex explicit expressions for my generators. So obviously, say B is just a Hamiltonian, as I told you. G3 is just the standard rotation. Uh, now I have to guess either P plus or P minus, or say P zero, and then P plus or P minus are fixed by SO3 rotations, and P is uh, related to K. So long story short, it's this. This is just expression for special conformal transformations. Okay? So now, how do you build uh, this representation? Not representation, but uh, specifically states. I want to find a state with spin L and charge L. So my guess would be the following. I add N minus one time with A zero, and then I act with A L just once. Obviously it has spin L projection of the spin L and charge M, right? Because those are charged. So obviously for L is not equal to one. So now I add K zero and K plus. You can think this is that they annihilate automatically, but K minus generates this itself. So it generates contribution with L minus one. But L minus one can be obtained if I add the term with L minus one and I trade one A zero for A one one. Now I act with K minus again, and they continue for forward. And then I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get this, it closes and, and I have this explicit expression for this state. Some coefficients of operators of the following form is a zero to some power times L minus K. But then I have to compensate in order to bring my spin to the same L, I have to act with K one one K times. So now if I want to bring state L and M, I just commute it with J minus L minus one times and I'm more or less Done. So what we have found, we have found building block A L one and one and two and two and so on and so forth. Now we can expand it in wraps if I wish 
But the long story short that those are the only operators. You can just count the number and you can convince yourself we're doing this in our paper, but I'm not gonna do it here. You can convince yourself that those exhaust all possible operators with charge smaller than spin. All primary operators. Just as an example, say you take M22, it's like this. Now you have the expression for the primary state, which is given by this form. So if I have just what, three minutes, I, I can say about, uh, yeah, just just two, two minutes. I, I'll, I'll tell you how far I can trust this expression for, uh, for spin, okay? Just looking at this expression, you see, Maybe it's more visible here. Yeah. So if you take the state, this is the leading term. The subleading term is written here, subleading in, in the sense of L over N expansion. You see that the relative contribution of this and that, it goes as L over square root of M. Because this guy is proportional to N minus one factorial, right? N minus one factorial square root. And this is N minus two factorial square root, right? The, the, the norm. Therefore, the overall, this one is bigger by square root of n times, right? However, this one is enhanced by L, it's L or sufficiently large L, this L times L, the square root of just L. So the suppression goes is as L over square root of n. Okay? Now, if I forget about this part, and I say that then, the state is written just like this. I can write it as KLL. This is what I call KLL. I find the commutation relation and ta -da, it commutes to one and those are precisely the creation annihilation operators that we constructed in uh, semi-classical approximation. So just to, to make this statement, so how, how far can we trust, as I said, not more than square root of M, However, the surprising thing happens. Even though I do not know what this primary state is, from, it, it, imagine that now I go back and I try to build this semi-classical construction. I do not know the full solution. It's here I know, for here I know the full solution, right? I can construct everything. But if I do semi-classics, it's expansion just one over N. I won't be able to tell you the full result unless I go further and further in perturbation theory, right? If I truncate myself somewhere, I'm at a at certain order. How far can I trust this expansion? Only up to L of order square root of N, not more, right? But surprising thing happens that now with the help of the full result, they can compute say, some order parameters like phi bar phi to power N or derivatives of phi. And this is what we did. If you compute the following expectation value computed in state with charge with charge M and spin L, you would assume that if correction to this state become of order one, once the first one is suppressed, it is comparable to one, then it breaks down, right? So it's like, I was starting by saying that uh, my profile is just the absolute value times some phase, but if corrections are large so that the absolute value becomes close to zero, then, that should correspond to the break, breaking down of my perturbation phase. However, it doesn't happen. And what we observe that expansion actually runs in L over N. So for any observable, I have L over N expansion. Okay, but if I want to find a specific state, it's only L over square root of N. So, but how, how does it look like if I look closely at the state, I see that for sufficient small L, I told you that it's the first term, but for sufficiently large L, it's some term that corresponds to uh, K of order two L squared over M. Okay, so it's given by, also looks like some semi-classical contribution maybe, but um, we do not know. So here I'm, I'm done. Just to wrap up, what I tried to explain that semi-classical semi-classical, Construction works uh, explicitly for conformal field, field theory. So if you take theory at, at Wilson-Fisher fixed point, you can show how 
the construction works in analytics. We don't have to resort to any complicated uh, numerical solutions or something like this. I, I can do everything just analytically. And it uh, matches with perturbative computation. And at the same time, if I want to ask myself, what is the spectrum that I found? What does it correspond to? I can also construct explicit operators that correspond, that have the those spins and dimensions. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sasha, hello. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I want to, you know, uh, trying to not to be confused that, um, you know, when you do this uh, kind of construction of the state, I can try to compare it, le let's say, if it would be like a normal Schrodinger picture where we're considering, you know, um, uh, space of states uh, at time equals zero, say. No, I mean, uh, then it would be kind of less dimension, right? D equal to uh, space, uh, and we can introduce, say, notion of... Uh, I don't know, kind of when your moment over there, whatever. Your your classification refers to dimension three, right? It's not uh, not dimension two uh, states, right? It's what I'm trying to check. No, uh, um, my construction is three dimension, three dimensional. Right, know? right. Uh, yeah. So yeah so so in this way those states are not um, like initial states uh, you know in if I will consider say Hamiltonian development, right? This, it, no, it, it's it's the other way around. It's precisely the Hamiltonian development. No, 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 no. no, no the, my states live on 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 spheres. I do not have to consider states. No, 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 no. But a sphere, it is uh, uh, how, how 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 many? What is the dimension of the sphere? Two. Two. Uh, 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 I see. So no. So so in this way, uh, a sphere dimension two is analog of uh, say uh, uh, say plane of dimension two. If I would consider say uh, no, a kind of no, normal construction, right? Or it's not not the case. Yes, exactly. Except that I'm. This is what I was trying to say. I'm not quantizing on slices where the slice is is a plane, two dimensional plane. I'm con I'm quantizing on slices where slices are two-dimensional spheres. Right, right. but two-dimensional sphere I can view as a kind of disk made out, um, no, I mean, that you, you, you like a, a kind of uh, a limited plane, right? So, so in this way, you kind of convert a plane into the, into the sphere, right? Or in some way. I see. I see. No, it's what I was saying. How, uh, so, so, but you, uh, but you refer to um, operators, say, for example, ma of momentum. Operator of momentum was uh, still uh, in, uh, uh, say, J3. It was uh, referring to dimension three, uh, but uh, still you apply it on 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 on, on uh, two-dimensional sphere, right? Uh, when you classify it. Well, or, uh, imagine that you have states on on the sphere obviously they are labeled by their spin so3 because so3 is yeah yes yeah, so it's what i'm checking indeed yeah i see so 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 in this sense it's not like you know so it is still two-dimensional states i see yes those are actual physical states yes i see living on two-dimensional spheres I see. I, you know, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry that I maybe I'm kind of, but I did I, I did try to make it sure for myself at least uh, that I'm following. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are these well known or this? No. Uh, no. Nobody. For free theory, nobody has free theory, well, there, there are several results. People know how to count. Some people know how to construct in, uh, in, uh, in like iterative procedures. But there is no formula. What what we derive? That's uh, to my knowledge. This is the first one. But, yeah. Look, uh, free theory doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's super easy. Okay, if you do that for uh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not, not all the questions can be can be answered by especially here, right? If the, the, the difficulty is that you have many fields, 
right? There are many, too many, uh, yeah, the variety of, of operators that you can write down, it grows, okay, maybe not exponentially, but a lot, right? So you have way too many operators just to say, oh yeah, this one is that one. So towards the start, you said that you, you, you study physically like n particles to n particles. Yes. Uh, uh, can you use your results to study two to two n minus two? Look, I'm, uh, this is this is my goal. The moment I did not know how to how to do that. This is my that's my like a big they are not given by the same correlators. No, no, right? Uh, not completely because okay. uh, but one, one it's a linear combination of various ends, look, right? there are different complications. First. Say you, you can ask the following question. People in the 90s were trying to do to, to study two to n or large n. And usually they were doing for say scalar theory. But this scalar theory first is not charged. Here, since I have charge, that saves me. Charge is protected thing. Number of particles is not protected. Right? So finding a semi-classical is hard. In, in, number of particles, one some particles. Sure, but this one is not protected, right? It's uh, it's only the charge that it, that you know if you fix your um, yeah. If you work in the sector with fixed charge, it cannot be changed. But if you say now I go to a sector with uh, fixed number of particles, okay. So it's when we study the correlators with the fixed charge that will correspond to a linear combination of various uh, amplitudes, right? Um, with, with the same charge content. Look, I want to say that that would look like expansion in partial weights, right? Um, well, uh, I do not know the answer. I do not know the answer. How to relate this directly to the amplitude in question. But this is my is insane. This is my the beacon. This is where I want to go. But uh, yeah, not the, not at the moment. No questions? Okay. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Arkady. Uh, thank you. Thanks for all the questions. No, I, I already asked my question. Oh, I said thank you for all the questions. Ah, <laughs> uh, but I do not see you. Actually, okay, you disappeared from the screen. Ah, here, I see. Okay, so uh, it is your projection from uh, sphere to, to our dimensions. Yes, this is my projection to from from